So welcome again to this uh, first webinar of the GIWACAF series. Um, and I will start with a brief introduction to the GIWACAF, because uh, as you know, it's called the GIWACAF webinar series. So better uh, to know what is the GIWACAF and what we, what we do as a project. So uh, GIWACAF, the GI of the GIWACAF is it's for the global initiative. So it's good to understand that GIWACAF is part of a, of, a, of a global program, which is called the Global Initiative, which was launched in 1996 by the International Maritime Organization and IPICA, uh, which is the Global Oil and Gas Industry Association for Advancing Environmental and Social Performance, with a general objective of improving and enhancing the capacity of beneficiary countries to prepare for and respond to accidental marine oil spills and encourage the ratification and implementation of relevant IMO conventions, but we'll go back to this later. The particular aspect of this uh, program is, is there is a strong cooperation between the, uh, uh, the industry, I mean, the private sector and the, uh, nas the, the national authorities and international authorities with the IMO. And there are, this is in line with the recommendation of a very important convention uh, that will be presented briefly by Colleen and uh, more in detail in, a, in, a, in another webinar, which is the International Convention of, on Oil Pollution Preparedness, Response and Cooperation. Yeah, it's quite long, but it's uh, summarized in OPRC 90. I remember this OPRC 90, you, you will see this a lot in the uh, presentation. So uh, the global initiative, as I said, uh, GIWACAF is just part of, uh, is just one of the regional projects. We have other sister projects in the Caspian Sea and Black Sea, it's called Osprey or another uh, sister project in the Southeast Asia, so GIC. And GIWACAF, obviously, WACAF is for West, Central and uh, Southern Africa. So as you can see on the map, it's all the Atlantic coast of Africa. So briefly, if the Global Initiative was launched in 1996, as I said, the GIWACAF, so the regional project of the Global Initiative for West, Central and Southern Africa, started in 2006 with more or less the same objective, which is to enhance the capacity of partner countries to prepare for and respond to oil spills, in a, always in the idea of a better protection of the marine environment and uh, of the uh, mar uh, coastal environment and communities. Uh, basic, basically, we, have, we are a technical assistant project, so we uh, uh, assist countries and we do organize workshops, training, exercises and conferences in 22 countries with a budget. Uh, it's no surprise, huh? you see the logos here coming from IMO and IPICA. Uh, yeah, I think it's, this one is quite an interesting map. Uh, it's the geographical coverage of the GIWACAF project. As you can see, 22 countries are part of the initiative uh, from Mauritania down to South Africa. All these 22 countries of the Atlantic coast of Africa are part of the initiative. Uh, it means we have a focal point uh, within the national authorities of these 22 countries and we work in close liaison with all of them. So it's quite a huge ge geographical remit. Uh, briefly on what we do, uh, the, I think the, the, sim the simple way is to just put picture uh, what we do. The first thing is to uh, set up preparedness and response drills and exercises. As you can see on the pictures here, uh, you have, for example, a deployment exercise in Côte d'Ivoire, which happened last year on, on your left uh, hand corner. And uh, on your right one, you have a, a picture which, which was taken in, in Angola during uh, last uh, summer. And it was a transboundary exercise between Angola and Namibia. So it was a really successful uh, event. So this is the kind of thing we could organize. The first thing are exercises. Second thing, things are um, trainings and capacity building activities. And I would like to stress the fact that we always organize this kind of uh, activities in, in direct liaison with the, with the partner countries who are, uh, which are asking for it. So it could be uh, on uh, various uh, topics which are linked to oil field preparedness and response. You can see in the box that there are lots of different topics. It could be liability and compensation, contingency planning, dispersion, shoreline response, etc. Uh, the good thing is during this web this webinar series will uh, address several of these topics. So just like during a capacity building activity, and uh, yeah, should be able to better understand this uh, topic of preparedness and response to oil spills at the end. 
We also do organize workshops at the national and sub-regional levels. Uh, workshops are uh, really organized to um, answer a particular need. Uh, for example, it could be transposition of the uh, international convention, or it could be a particular topic if a country, for example, wants to develop its uh, um, dispersion policy at the national level, then we come to the country and we do set up a workshop with all the stakeholders to uh, really um, support the country in this uh, difficult uh, and complex tasks. Uh, this is a map just it can gives you an idea of what we what we do. It was last year, all the activities we implemented last year. Uh, you see quite a lot of activities uh, on different topics, always linked to all spill preparedness and response. Um, yeah, various countries, various uh, from uh, Francophone Africa, English speaking uh, Africa, Portuguese speaking as well. I mean, we, we do cover all these countries and we try to go as uh, often as we can and uh, set up activities always in close liaison with the, with the, with the, the national authorities. I think it's really important. Results, uh, briefly, here you have a lot, lot more information on our website and reports, but uh, this is what we've been doing since 2006. It means we organize more than 120 activities in the 22 countries uh, of GIA World Cup. And uh, we train together more than 5,000 people in these various countries. So it means that there are a lot of people who attended uh, GIA World Cup activities and workshops, so, and I hope uh, many of the of these of these people uh, are here today uh, listening to us during this webinar. Uh, also, you can see on the on the small chart that uh, between 2006 and 2019 there were huge progress in the region, uh, particularly, for example, on the designation of authority. It means that the country uh, designated uh, a particular authority to be in charge of uh, preparedness and response, and uh, so in 2006. Only 12 countries of the 22 countries had this kind of authority in place, and no, all the countries do have a responsible authority. So it's, uh, it's really a huge progress. And it, it was the same thing for several of the topics you can uh, see on the, on the chart. Um, I won't go through all of them, but uh, you can have a look if you want uh, later on, because it will be possible to download this presentation. Uh, I've tried to summarize in a few points uh, what the GeoACAP is and what the GeoACAP does. Uh, I will go clockwise from the top. Uh, so things to remember, I mean, the GeoACAP is a joint endeavor between the public and private sector on which solely works on oil spill preparedness and response. So it's very specific. Uh, it supports 22 African partner countries in the, the development and strengthening of their national oil spill preparedness and response systems. We work alongside these 22 partner countries and we do maintain a constant liaison with them to pro always provide tailored capacity building solutions. So we always stay uh, close to the needs of our partners and we implement the the, the things that are needed that are needed. To, the, to do that, we do organize workshops, training courses and exercises, as I just mentioned. And we always encourage better communication and collaboration between governments and the industry, the oil industry, but also the maritime industry, because uh, ships are also a source of pollution, as we'll see. And um, we also encourage all our partner countries to ratify and implement the international conventions stemming from the IMO and other UN bodies, and we do help them to do so, because it could be a complex task to, uh, to undertake. So briefly, this is the GI World Cup. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, we have a website, we have a LinkedIn page. Uh, we are quite easy to find, to be honest, because there is not a lot of uh, project called the GIA World Cup, so just Google us and you will find us. Uh, you could um, download all the activity reports for all the activities we've done, so the 120 activities, we have reports for, for them. For example, if you are, if you are coming from a GIA World Cup, a country is covered by GIA World Cup, you could have a look and you will know what was the last activity we implemented in your country and why it could be, uh, and what were the recommendations following this activity. Uh, I think here we are, now that you understand what we do, you understand why we are doing this uh, series of webinar, is because uh, we, um, uh, as you know, we, we can't travel anymore until the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is over, 
So uh, we, uh, we, we, it's a, it's a solution to uh, continue our capacity building work. Uh, so this GeoWorker webinar series will cover the different dimension of hospital power preparedness and response, as you can see on the arrow on the on the slide here. Uh, the first one is introduction, and uh, this is the one of for today. We will have uh, also uh, a dedicated uh, webinar on the international legal framework. Uh, it's really important uh, that. I mean, that it, because there are many uh, um, conventions that are uh, that are important for hospital preparedness and response, and we'll see how to implement it, how to uh, understand them. So it's it's quite a, it's quite a complex topic, but really understand uh, interesting. And uh, the further we go, uh, we'll go into um, into the various aspects of so hospital contingency planning, how to respond to. Um, Really, how to respond to a to a noise spill at sea first, and on, on the, when when it reaches the shoreline, and on the second part, and also we'll uh, tackle the wildlife and preparedness and response, uh, which is a, a very hot topic these days. So back to the first webinar, I've uh, nearly finished. So the learning objective objectives of today is to really understand what are the sources and fates of my noise spill, understand what are the potential impacts understand what actions could be taken. And as you know, there will be other uh, webinars dedicated to that and understand the critical role of the IMO, the industry and the global initiative in this uh, particular aspect and topic. So uh, back to the presenters, uh, just to let you know how it will go. Uh, so Jamie from uh, OSL will deliver the first presentation and then we'll have Frank from ITOP, and finally Colleen from the International Maritime Organization. And at the end of the free presentation, uh, we do a Q&A session of about 15, 20 minutes. So I encourage you to uh, write your question in the chat. And uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Emily, uh, who is monitoring the chat, thank you, Emily, by the way, will uh, flag the questions. And at the end of the, of the, of the webinar, we'll answer them. We probably won't be able to, to um, and so all the questions this morning, we had the French version of this webinar and uh, there was a lot, a lot of questions, which is very good. And uh, so, yeah, just, uh, just, uh, yeah, just ask your question and we'll do our uh, best to answer them. Also, you should be able to uh, uh, download files. Uh, so at the end of each uh, presentation, I will uh, make available the presentation uh, itself, so you you'll be able to uh, download the slide deck. Uh, you should have a, it should be visible on your uh, webinar interface. So do not uh, hesitate to uh, to download them. So you should no, I mean uh, you should be able to uh, follow this webinar, and I will uh, hand over to Jamie for the for the first presentation. Uh, yeah, hand over to you, Jamie. Thank you very much. Okay, Julian, thank you very much. So I'll just bring up uh, my session to start off with. So um, good afternoon, I think for most of you looking at the chat, I think there might be a few good mornings as well for some of our uh, colleagues who are joining us from the Americas. Um, so my name is Jamie Gathercole. I'm with Oil Spill Response Limited or OSRL. Um, so I think most people will be vaguely familiar with OSRL, but for those who aren't, um, we are an industry owned response organization so we respond to oil spills globally uh, for a range of member oil companies. Um, so we've got our main response bases in Southampton in the UK, in Singapore, in Bahrain and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, so I'm based in our Southampton operation. And prior to my current role in our training team, I spent six years in our response department. So actually being deployed as part of the on-call team to respond to spills around the world. And several of those have included projects in uh, West Africa. So I'm going to be speaking for the next uh, 20 minutes or so on the key sources of oil spills around the world, uh, with a little bit of a focus on Africa as well, and looking at the main fates that we tend to see, specifically with marine oil spills. So what we'll look to achieve through that session is have a better understanding of those key sources of oil spills into the marine environment. Um, and obviously, once you have an understanding of the sources, you can then start to have a better idea of the steps you can take around preparedness to be better equipped to respond to those spills when they do occur. Um, and also a key part is having a better understanding of the likely fates 
Um, and the weathering processes, there's any spilled oil, again, into the marine environment specifically, will undergo. Um, and we'll look at the main oil properties that we as a response organisation use to inform those, those response making decisions. So initially then, um, looking at the main sources or the main causes of marine oil spills, and this is obviously on a global basis, um, as Julian touched upon, shipping can be a really key source of oil spills. So some of the largest and probably game-changing incidents that we've seen over the last few decades have come from various vessel-based incidents. Um, so those top three, as you can see, they're all really relating to uh, vessel operations. Um, it's not so that the others aren't equally applicable. So for example, um, depending on what your operation is, there may be several of these that you identify with and you can uh, relate these to your own operations. And the key risks, so the key um, sources that you may be aware of or may be concerned about within your, your own operation are obviously going to rely on or be dictated by that risk assessment. So looking at both the likelihood and then the potential severity of those key um, exposure points. So looking at a, um, a three-year data set here for global oil spills, um, this is the number of spills per million tonnes of production. And obviously we're looking at 2015 to 2017. So this is from the IOGP report. Uh, there is a link to the, that at the bottom there. Um, and it's that three-year data set that's got the most resolution or the most comparable data. So that's why we focus on that one there. Um, and again, with that focus on um, statistics for Africa specifically, you can see that, that over that three-year data set, if you average those out, there's really no significant difference in the number of spills. And obviously, as I said, this is against or normalized against the volume of production. So the number of spills per unit of production is really no different within Africa than we see globally. Where we do start to see a bit of a difference though, is the actual volume of oil spilled per million tonnes of production. So that's the same uh, ratio that's normalised against that, the million tonnes of production. Um, so what we see here is that within Africa, again, looking at that three-year data set as a whole, we average around about six tonnes of oil lost per million tonnes of production. Whereas if we look at a global basis, then that's just over three. So on the whole, over that data set, uh, we're seeing around about double the amount of production that is lost within Africa. Now, we can actually delve into this in a little bit more detail if we start to then split those out between onshore versus offshore spills. Um, so I should mention that this is only looking at spills of greater than uh, one barrel. Um, so obviously in terms of the number of oil spills, uh, including all of that sub one barrel data would we'll start to throw those numbers out a little bit. So those have been discarded for the purposes of this analysis. So if we look at offshore spills, um, the left hand graphic there, you can see that again, within Africa, the uh, relative numbers are not quite double, but a little bit higher within Africa for that offshore exploration and production environment than that which we see globally. And again, relative to the, the total numbers, that's all coming down a little bit. So if I go back one slide, you can see there that the averages here are about six tons and three tons respectively for Africa and global data. Whereas here, we're working below one ton lost per million tons of production for both of those data sets. So what that says is that overall, offshore exploration and production sees much re or much reduced uh, rate of loss than onshore. Um, unfortunately, given the, uh, the sparsity of the um, cause data that's been collected along with this, it's not really possible to actually infer any absolute conclusions, um, but just anecdotally or from people's own um, experience and exposure, I'm sure you can start to appreciate why this may be the case in various circumstances. So coming back to that comparison, the key difference that we do actually start to see is when you compare onshore um, spill volumes lost uh, within Africa versus that global data set. And you can see if you focus on the axis on the right hand side there, um, we're now measuring at a completely different scale. So this is going up to just over 50 tonnes per million tonnes of production lost within African onshore production within 2015. 
So what we see as a whole there, again, just treating this as a three-year data set and looking for an average between those. Um, within Africa, we're seeing an average of around about 35, 36 tonnes lost per million tonnes of production, whereas that global data set, again, it is higher for global onshore versus um, global total production. But there we're looking at an average of around about five to six. So a really significant increase in the volume of oil lost from African onshore operations compared to both global and African offshore operations. Now, as I said, unfortunately, we can't um, infer too much about the actual underlying causes for this. But obviously, there's a significant enough data set there over a multi-year time frame that you can certainly start to identify some patterns. Overall, what this says is that there is no greater frequency for um, of large or greater than one barrel oil spills um, within Africa compared to a global data set. So frequency is unchanged. What we do see is a significant increase in the volume that is lost when those spills do occur. And obviously, when you consider the steps that you might need to take to be appropriately prepared for those instances, um, when they do occur, there's obviously certain factors you can put in place to minimise the likelihood there. But if you have an awareness that the volume of spill overall that you might expect to deal with might be a little bit greater, that's when you can really start to take uh, very concrete and affirmative steps to be best, better prepared for those spills when they do occur. So we do have um, a small amount of data regarding the, the causes there. Um, so we've got the cause actually recorded for the majority of those incidents, but these are the greater than 100 barrel data sets. The previous data we've looked at was just greater than one barrel. Now, what we've pulled out here is um, the two, or the central and, and right-hand column in that table. We've got the percentage of incidents and then the percentage of volume spilled that these represent. And obviously, if these were proportional, you'd expect to see these, um, these numbers fairly much in line. Um, what we do see then, or where we can consider a disproportionately high volume of oil lost, is that third party damage. So as you can see there, it's responsible for only 40%, sorry, 46% of the total number of incidents, but it's actually accountable for 68% of the volume of oil that is lost. So it's those third party damage incidents, and there's a significant number of them there, 16 of 35, nearly 50% uh, there, that count for around about a 50% greater volume of oil spilled than you would expect to see. Again, I would be reluctant to start trying to infer any underlying reasons for this, but there is a significant data set there and a relatively significant statistical trend underlying. So those of you who are exposed to third party damage, and obviously this is particularly relevant with inland or onshore operations, um, this is something that, again, we just need to be very mindful of when we're planning how to be best prepared for those incidents when they do occur. So coming on now to some of the key properties of oil. Again, as a response operation, this is something that we would look to get really affirmative data on at the earliest stage possible, really, of an incident. So for the members that we work with, we have copies of their oil spill contingency plans readily available. So we would refer to that for that data. Uh, but occasionally we work with third parties who are not members of OSRL. Um, and so really these are the key points that we would look to pull out of their assay sheet or their oil spill contingency plan as early as possible, because these really take a, a key role in defining how we would expect the oil to behave once released offshore. So running through these in turn, um, specific gravity or API. So these are two, uh, two units for the same data set. So this is referring to the density of that oil. How heavy is it? And obviously the key one for us is this dictates whether the oil is going to float. So the specific gravity of seawater is about 1.025. So for us, we know that anything with a specific gravity of below that should float on the sea surface. And we do occasionally encounter crude oils that have a specific gravity of greater than seawater, and therefore there's a high likelihood that they might actually sink. Moving on then, we've got viscosity. So this dictates how readily the oil will flow. Um, and obviously on a, in an inland environment, this dictates the rate it will spread out if it's released from a pipeline, for example. And the same actually applies on the sea surface. So a low viscosity oil 
will spread out very rapidly to cover a large surface area, but a very, very thin surface layer there. So understanding how that's going to spread out obviously influences the response resources that we might look to mobilize for an incident. We've then got the pore point. So the pore point of an oil we would always regard relative to the sea temperature. Um, and that pore point, as the graphic suggests there, it's just the, uh, the temperature below which an oil does not flow. For example, if we had a pore point of uh, 15 degrees Celsius with an oil, um, in UK waters, for example, in the winter months, the sea temperatures there are dropping down to six to 10 degrees. So that oil may actually act as a semi-solid on the sea surface. Whereas if you take that oil and introduce it into the surface waters in West Africa, where we've got sea temperatures of 20 degrees or greater, then that's going to influence the oil to behave as a liquid and flow much more readily. Moving on then, we've got volatility. So when this is derived from an assay sheet, what we look at is the percentage which evaporates at 200 degrees C. And as a rule of thumb, we would say that this is the percentage of the oil slick that we would actually expect to lose to evaporation over the first 24 hours of an incident. So obviously there are a few assumptions there and the ambient temperature and wind speed, these are all gonna play a role in potentially a greater or a lesser rate of evaporation. But that's just a rule of thumb you know, to, to inform the response team of the total volume of oil that's been lost, how much are we expecting to remain on the sea surface that we're then responding to. Um, the other issue with volatility is obviously there is a chance of this creating a hazardous environment for our response personnel or any ongoing operations or assets in that area. So with a high volatility, we may need to stand down our assets or operate from a greater range um, in that first 12 or 20, 24 hours, whatever it may be, before those uh, volatile or um, combustible gases come back down to a safe level. And then finally, we've got asphaltine content. So this is one of the compounds within a crude oil. And what asphaltine does is, again, for us as a response team, it suggests how likely the oil is to form a stable emulsion, so to emulsify. And for us, the threshold that we use is 0.5%, so half of a percent by weight. And anything above that, we would suggest that that oil has the chance or is um, likely to form a stable emulsion on the sea surface. Again, there's other factors that drive that. So for example, a greater level of wave energy, so a lot of mixing um, of a, a area of water with a greater sea state, that's going to accelerate that process. Um, whereas an oil spilt on a much calmer sea, it's going to mix with the water at a much lesser rate. So it may not emulsify, or it may do so much, much slower. Um, again, coming back to us as a response team, once an oil does start to emulsify, some of those response options are either less likely to work as effectively or are completely off the table. So we touched on the um, specific gravity of the oil there a moment ago. And you can see here that the uh, specific gravity actually dictates the ITOP grouping that the oil is uh, put into. So for example, anything of a specific gravity of 0.8 to 0.85, this would be classified as a group two oil. So this just gives us four nice, easy groupings um, to describe various crude oils within or other hydrocarbons as well. Um, what this means is that when we talk about a group two oil, there are several fundamental traits or characteristics that we can um, infer about that without needing necessarily to do further analysis. So this graphic here, you can see that the slick volume, for some of these, it may increase initially above 100% as that oil potentially starts to emulsify. Um, but it's also showing the persistence. So for how long we would have, for example, 50% of that slick remaining on the sea surface. And if we look at that group two crude oil here, we can see that quite quickly, the 50% mark is dropped below within hours. Um, obviously, there are some group two crudes which may last a little bit longer than that. But again, as a rule of thumb, this starts to give us an idea of whether the oil we are working with is going to persist on the sea surface for hours, days, weeks or months.
Okay, um, as I mentioned, the specific gravity and the API, those um, two units just describe the same property. Um, and depending on which part of the world you're operating in, some use specific gravity primarily, and some use API. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, one or both of those. So now if we look at um, how the oil is actually going to behave and then the ultimate fate of it on the sea surface. So in the early stages of an incident or a spill, very, very quickly, I'm sure you can appreciate that the rate of spread um, is going to cover many square meters, potentially square kilometers in the early stages of an incident. Um, obviously the volume of oil is going to influence that, but also the volatility, the current and the wind. These are all going to, sorry, the volatility, I meant to say the viscosity, the currents and the wind. Um, and these are all going to influence the rate of spread of that oil slick. We then see evaporation. So again, this uh, begins almost instantaneously, but the greater extent of slick is able to spread out over, it then has a greater surface area, which allows more evaporation. So for example, if we had a 100 ton, oh sorry, 100 litre, diesel spill within a harbour, if that's contained and boomed in, it'll have a limited surface area. So the rate of evaporation will be much, much less. Diesel having a very low viscosity, if it's offshore, it can spread out over a large area, and therefore the rate of evaporation can be much greater. And as I said, evaporation is also influenced by ambient temperature, wind speed, and so on. So again, very in the early stages of that incident, we'll start to see natural dispersion. So not to be confused with chemical dispersion, so actually applying dispersants. This is just a natural process where the oil starts to mix with the water column, starts to form very, very small droplets, which are then distributed through the water column. So it starts to break down vertically. Now, the majority of the oil slick will remain on the sea surface. And in this image here, you can see there is a, still a consistent slick on that sea surface but we start to see a few little droplets start to break their way into the water column. And we would generally see these distributed over the top five to 10 meters of the water column, depending on the wave energy and the level of mixing there. Again, this is a completely natural process as a response team. This just means for us that with some oil loss to evaporation, some oil loss to natural dispersion, we may actually only have to contend with maybe 50% of the original volume that was lost um, as the slick remaining on the sea surface. But of that uh, remaining surface slick, we often start to see fragmentation. So this is the process whereby uh, one initial slick actually breaks up into multiple smaller slicks. So again, this is partly driven by the wind. Um, the oceanic currents have a, an impact here as well. And again, bringing it back to us as a response operation, what this means is that what may have been one large slick initially, potentially after 24 or 48 hours, could become two, three or four smaller slicks, which are actually relatively distant on the sea surface. And if we have limited resources, and generally this is the case that we would not have you know, all of the response resources we could possibly want, we then need to start prioritizing which areas those resources operate in. So for example, we might look to use an aerial surveillance asset, so a helicopter or an aeroplane, to direct our response vessels into the areas of the largest slick or the heaviest level of contamination so we can really prioritize and get best use of those resources. Okay, moving on into a slightly longer time frame here. So emulsification, obviously, as I said, that's driven by asphaltine content. Um, and this is a process that can begin fairly rapidly, uh, but can take um, over 24 hours, over 48 hours in some instances to really um, show a significant change on the oil slick on that sea surface. So with emulsification, what we tend to see is the volume of slick in total will increase as the oil actually starts to take in water at a molecular level. So the, the oil and the water mix and form a compound on the sea surface. It will still tend to be positively buoyant. It'll remain floating there on the sea surface, uh, but the viscosity can increase and some of the other properties can change there as well. What this means to us, again, as a response team, is that maybe chemical dispersant is no longer an option. So the nature of chemical dispersant relies on some of the oil properties which are no longer applicable there, and therefore we might need to consider other response techniques. One of those may be containment and recovery, so using booms and skimmers to recover that oil. But again, with emulsification, 
it may be that some of the skimmers that would have been available are no longer an option. So they may be less effective or they may not work at all. So the choice of response equipment is actually hugely influenced by the asphaltine content and therefore the likely rate of emulsification of that oil slip. So then potentially depending on the proximity to shoreline, we might expect to see stranding. Um, obviously, if there is a significant distance for the oil to cover before it hits any um, stretch of shoreline, we would look to mobilise the appropriate response resources to prevent it from doing so. Because at the point of stranding, the, uh, the wildlife impact, the complexity of the cleanup operation, um, both the public and the media focus can be much, much um, magnified. And just the expense of the cleanup operation as well. These are all um, growing greatly with, um, with oil hitting that shoreline. So this is something we would always look to prevent with whatever offshore uh, mitigation measures we can put in place. And obviously the type of equipment that is appropriate for a shoreline impact is very different as well. So again, coming back to everyone on the call as an operator or as government representative potentially, if you do have a high likelihood of a shoreline impact, then again, the type of equipment you would look to have uh, readily available in country or nearby is going to differ. So coming into a couple of um, less obvious processes to finish off with then. So biodegradation. So this is the microbial process which actually um, metabolizes oil that is either broken down into the water column through natural dispersion or indeed chemical dispersion. Um, and it can also account for some oil that is stranded. So if we go back to that previous stranding image, obviously thick levels of uh, black oil like that, they're not going to biodegrade particularly readily. But if you remove the vast majority of that and you're left with a, a light level of staining, then you can allow for biodegradation to potentially account for that final maybe one or two percent of the oil. If we focus in an offshore environment, biodegradation basically decomposes or metabolizes that crude oil back down to its base compound, so to carbon and hydrogen. Um, and this is the ultimate fate of a lot of oil spills offshore. What this means is that as those microbial communities increase in number, they are capable generally of biodegrading the oil at the rate at which it enters the water column. So that's either through natural or chemical dispersion. Um, and then once that oil is metabolized, those communities of microbes, they'll just reduce in number again, back to background levels. But this is always relying on microbial communities, which are already present within the water column. So we're never looking at introducing additional microbial communities, for example, into the water. And then finally, dissolution. So some elements of the oil will just dissolve into the water column in the same way that um, you know, sea is dissolved into, this, um, into, sorry, salt is dissolved into the sea or sugar dissolves into a cup of tea. Um, what we do see though, is that we have very, very small volumes of these compounds will actually dissolve, um, certainly offshore. And with the rate of mixing, so both um, vertical mixing and horizontal dilution that we see with an offshore incident, um, it's very, very unlikely that we would see those dissolved uh, compounds from a harmful or detectable level to any marine life. So that really accounts for a very negligible uh, proportion of that slip overall. So when we consider how this actually affects us as a response team, I'm sure you can see there that some of those key oil properties, so those data points that we would look to pull out from an assay sheet or a contingency plan, these give us a really good idea as to what our initial actions within a response team or an incident management team may be. Um, further to that, you can either take advantage of any technical advice, so through OSRL um, or any of the other response parties that may be available to assist, and that can we can provide a little bit of further guidance there. Um, but you can also run computer models to actually simulate how an oil spill will behave over a period of time, whether it's 24 hours up to five days. And what that then informs for us is depending on the persistence of the oil and depending on the trajectory and the track it's likely to take, um, this can then give us a pretty good idea of what may be the most appropriate response options. So here, this is shown as a bit of a continuum, but I appreciate there is a, a significant overlap between these. So for a very low persistent oil, it may be that monitor and evaluate is an acceptable um, option. So we would just track that oil um, as it travels a short distance and hopefully starts to break down on the sea surface. 
With greater persistence, we may need to mobilize resources. So this could be spraying chemical dispersants, that's that middle image there. Um, and that could obviously be from an aircraft or a vessel. So we could be looking to spray dispersant on that oil slick on offshore to prevent that shoreline impact. Or when we're seeing greater persistence, essentially greater viscosity as we look at a group three or a group four crude oil, um, it could be that then dispersant is actually no longer an effective option. So we start looking at containment and recovery. So using booms and skimmers to recover that oil slick offshore as best we can. Um, now there are huge areas of overlap between these. So that's not to say that uh, it, it runs in this continuum at all. Um, and obviously there are certain local or national policy factors which will influence which of these would be your, your primary option as well. Okay, so just to uh, recap really on some of the information that we've run through there, you can see that there are global trends around uh, the numbers of spills and the different causes that we've seen there. Um, we've also got a slight trend around the actual volume that's lost there as well. Um, but as I said, it's not really a comprehensive enough data set to really infer too much from those, uh, those trends that we can see there. But what we have seen historically is that the less frequent incidents, so examples such as tankers running aground or subsea well blowouts, these happen by far the least frequently, but they can often offer the largest impact uh, because of the, the volume of oil that is lost. As a response team, indeed as an operator, having a good understanding of what are those key oil properties and how would we expect them to influence how an oil might behave in a given environment is really important to have a good understanding of. And a lot of these obviously are uh, points that we can start to understand prior to an incident. So this really starts to build up a good part of the preparedness picture. However, that is only going to be based on, for example, um, lab samples of that oil. And obviously on the day of a release, um, the oil properties may mature over time. So before we start to rule any response options in or out, we would always advocate that uh, you take samples of that oil and just make sure that any assumptions as to how you believe it is going to behave are actually true for that oil slick on the day. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for your time there. Um, if there are any questions regarding that, then please populate the, uh, the chat function there and then I'll pass back over to Julian. Hey, th thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, really interesting. It's uh, it's quite a lot to uh, to digest. So, uh, as uh, as mentioned by by Jimmy, you could uh, contact him directly uh, on on his uh, email address if you want to ask question or uh, use the chat. Um, I I will make this available right now. Okay, so it should be available. And uh, now we, I will hand over to uh, Franck uh, from ITOP and he will deliver a presentation on the impacts of the oil spills uh, Jamie just um, explained to us. So Franck, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Julien. And thank you Jamie for the introductory talk. Um, so my name, uh, I'll start uh, introducing myself. Good afternoon everyone. Good morning to the one uh, uh, westward. Um, I'll self-introduce myself. My name is uh, Franck Larvel. I am a technical team manager with ITOP. Um, I've been uh, with ITOP for 14 years. My background is uh, marine biology. And uh, before that, I was working for CEDA, which is the French Institute dealing with uh, uh, providing advice and, and research on oil spill in general. <clears throat> so my talk today will be on environmental and economic impacts of oil spills and it will be articulated um, around four, four things. I'll start with a quick uh, single slide introduction to ITOP for the people who do not know what we do and who we are. Who, who we are. Then I'll, I'll give some uh, generalities on, on impacts, uh, environmental impacts of oil spills, and then go through um, a number of emblematic key species or habitats and how they, they are affected by or can be affected by, by oil spills. And then finally, I'll go through a, a few of the main economic impacts uh, observed uh, over the years uh, following oil spills. So first of all, ITOP. So we are um, a small organization based in London. Um, our main role is to uh, attend spills worldwide from ships, mainly, even though we sometimes attend mystery spills. We've, we've done that 
six months ago or eight months ago in, in Brazil in particular. Um, so yeah, shipping shipping incidents. The map on the top uh, left shows you uh, the, the fields we've attended worldwide uh, since 1972. Uh, we are funded by the, the shipping industry um, through uh, an annual fee, um, mainly initially tankers, now all types of merchant ships. So tankers are members and associates are um, associate member members. And you can see that we well our membership. Uh, represent uh, quite a, a vast majority of the ocean going uh, merchant ship in the world. So first of all, well, when there's a, when there's an oil spill, uh, in terms of impact, what what's the usual uh, public perception? Well, it's, it's very much driven by the, the media, and very often the media will start with showing very dramatic pictures and very dramatic headings of uh, seabirds or mammals, marine mammals. Uh, affected by the oil. Very often as well, nowadays at least, uh, uh, pictures from previous spills, not, not necessarily uh, related to the spill um, ongoing, for example. And, um, and although we all know there's been a, a very significant uh, damage to uh, bird populations or, or, or mammals uh, in, in some of the major oil spills historically, this is not systematic and uh, as a matter of fact, most of the spills we attend with ITOF, uh, we don't see, we see very limited impact on, on, uh, on birds and, and mammals. But when it happens, um, it can be quite severe. So over the years, as I said, historically, there's been quite a number of major spills uh, through what, before that, since ships have been carrying oil pretty much. Uh, so, since the 70s through the 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, there's been a number of major spills, and, and most of them have uh, given rise to a, a research program. And, and there's, a, there's been a number of studies carried out uh, over the years on, on different topics, different uh, species, different habitats. And uh, they pretty much usually, well, most of the time, show that uh, there can be widespread mortalities, especially with, with massive major incidents. Uh, but population are naturally resilient uh, to acute impacts and they usually restore within uh, months if it's a, a small incident or years or at the, at the most uh, decades. And there's been a, a few long-term impacts historically uh, observed on, on some uh, mammals, for example, um, or on the seabed population um, or, or uh, invertebrate um, habitats when the habitat has been damaged. But it's 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 quite the exception. The the, the, the main the main um, observation is that it, it restores itself and uh, the structure of the ecosystem is is uh, restored as well as a function. And and the reason for that is that well, oil spills are not the only uh, events which leads to uh, damage to marine ecosystems. There's there's natural events uh, such as ag uh, algal planktonic toxic bloom, uh, hurricane damage, any storms which can strand some invertebrates on the shore, heavy rainfall, so heavy, heavy input of, of fresh water in marine environment can lead to some mortalities. There's natural mortalities in winter as well, and, and proliferation from some species, sometimes natural, sometimes uh, with some input from uh, human uh, activities. So uh, the, the marine environment really has evolved to uh, to deal with that and and recover from that naturally and uh, and, and there's a few reasons for that, which are uh, the strategies and then the fact that fecundity in marine um, organisms, most of them at least, uh, is fairly high, and um, and and the larval the planktonic larval stage uh, is a very uh, it, it facilitates the, the, the restoration and recolonization of uh, depleted um, areas. So uh, the effects, four main categories uh, of, of effects from oil, the physical smothering, uh, which leads to a physiological impairment and impact on all the physio physiological uh, functions such as movement, uh, feeding, nutrition, respiration, uh, thermal control, <clears throat> and that's that's 
you know, well, that's very often the case with uh, mammals and and, uh, and sea birds. The the toxicity, the intrinsic uh, toxicity of, of the oil. So um, you know, the, the, the existence of uh, composition of the oil with toxic compounds. Uh, we, we we see a little bit more on that on the following slides, um, and then that this leads to impairments of molecular and cellular functions, which can be lethal or sublethal, uh, which which means it doesn't kill the animal, but it, even if it doesn't kill directly the animal or the organism, but even narcosis might lead to the death because um, uh, narcosis is when marine invertebrates will, for example, lose contact uh, with the substrate and therefore they, they'll be stranded by the, uh, the waves and, and sea on the shore and usually ends up uh, eat, eaten by uh, seabirds or die on, on, the, on, on the shore. Other uh, typical for major spills uh, effects observed is ecolog ecological changes. So the, the fact that some species are more tolerant to oil than others or to organic matter in general. So some, some species are very sensitive. They, they, they may disappear and they'll be uh, replaced by other species more tolerant and sometimes opportunistic species which can cope very, very well with, with oil might take over uh, communities. Uh, and uh, and it takes a while, uh, usually a few years, for for the, the normal uh, distribution and, and abundance of the various type of species to uh, to recover. Uh, indirect effects: so loss of habitats, uh, habitat and, and shelter. Um, that that might be due to the destruction of, of uh, shoreline habitats or or a coral reef in the case of, of a grounding of a ship. Uh, obviously, it's not directly linked to oil, but it's it's linked to the shipping incident. So habitat might be damaged. Um, and then if there's a loss of prey species, other species, uh, obviously feed on them, might uh, starve. Uh, another type of impact, which is uh, often uh, overlooked, I find, uh, it's the shoreline uh, response impacts and. Uh, there's, there's a few categories as well, which I've listed here. Probably more can be added. Uh, but one of the very common one is the uh, extraction of uh, large uh, quantities of sediment, sand in particular, but can be rocks and, and pebbles uh, sometimes, which leads to erosion of, 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 the, of the shoreline. It leads, it leads to marine community disruption. You know, if the mechanical cleanup is a bit too uh, aggressive, that can lead to destruction of, of uh, uh, the, the, the organisms living uh, within the sediment. Physical damage, as you can see on some of the pictures, the middle ones, uh, physical damage on the rocky shores, using heavy machinery to, uh, to remove uh, oiled rocks or to get access to, to difficult to access areas, which can lead to uh, destruction of, of uh, some areas. Ob obviously, all that will be recolonized eventually, but there's a very significant uh, acute effect. And then dispersants, and sometimes of dispersants, uh, uh, especially the, the, the old type, type one, um, when they're used in very uh, coastal or even shoreline, uh, in particular in, in mangroves, they can lead to some uh, damage to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the mangrove or to the organisms living uh, on the shore. So again, four key factors um, for the impact to assess the impact. The type of oil, we'll see that a different type of oil may have you know, different uh, type of impact. And volume, even though even a small spill can lead to a severe impact if it happens in, a, in an area with a lot of sensitivities. So the weathering, as we've seen with Jamie, uh, weathering is a key aspect and it, it will have a, an effect as well. If weather, fresh oil strands or if it's emulsion which has uh, drifted for, for weeks or days or weeks at the sea, the toxicity might be slightly different. Um, then there's the characteristics of the area, the sensitivity, vulnerability of, uh, of the area to pollution, the, the resources at risk uh, around the shoreline which might be affected, 
the, the time of year with the weather, the conditions, different sea conditions will lead to different weathering and different uh, potentially different uh, impacts. Um, and then um, uh, the exposure will very much vary um, with the seasonality. So the presence or absence of migra migratory species, for example, as birds in particular, <clears throat> mammals as well. So whether they're overwintering or, or breeding, you know, if, if the area where they are doing one or the other is affected, then we uh, end up with some uh, impacts. And then the, the cleanup, the cleanup operations, which uh, depending on what techniques are used, strategies might have an impact or mitigate uh, the, the, the impact. That's, that's the objective of, of, of the cleanup, obviously, to, to, mit to mitigate the damages and enhance uh, natural recovery. So uh, to highlight the two first uh, categories, the, the type of oil, uh, this is a simplistic way of showing it, but uh, globally, uh, light oils uh, are generally more toxic, although they can smother as well. And heavy oils uh, tend to smother a lot, and they are toxic, but less so than uh, light oils. They still have a lot of uh, pH, for example, heavy oils. Light oils are generally considered more, more toxic or observed to be more toxic due to the, um, the light fractions, which are small molecules, uh, in particular the aromatics, uh, small aromatics, which are much uh, more uh, bioavailable to, to the organisms, uh, and hence the highest uh, uh, acute toxicity. Uh, then. I'm sure we, you've all seen this, but the, the, the different types of uh, shorelines and environment will have different sensitivities, and usually there's, there's a decline uh, along uh, the, the, the degree of exposure of the shoreline. So rocky shores, pebble shores, very exposed, are usually more uh, prompt to, to be self-clean. The natural cleanup will, will uh, occur much, much, in a much easier way. And then the more you go to sheltered uh, environments, um, uh, the more sensitive uh, they are and, and, and the more uh, the, the oil will uh, uh, persist in this type of soft sediment uh, environment. So now we're going through a, a number of, of the, the key species and, and habitats, starting with, with seabirds and, and, and marine mammals, since they make the headlines uh, uh, usually. Uh, so seabirds and, and, and marine mammals, uh, they're vulnerable, uh, although it's very much depending, depending on, on the behavior. So some species or group, group of species, families of, of seabirds, are more, uh, more affected usually, and, and it's, it's directly linked to the, the time they spend, uh, they spend on water, on the surface of water, so the, the, the likelihood of them uh, encountering a, a slick. So all the divers, the ducks, the you know, marine ducks, um, loons, uh, all the type of species are very much, very, very vulnerable, and, and they usually make the, the, the very high ratio uh, in, in bird mortalities uh, when when there's when there's uh, bird mortalities. Same thing with the mammals, the, the pelagic ones uh, are usually, though there's some exceptions as always, less uh, affected. Uh, mammals living very close to the shore, um, interacting with, with coastal waters like uh, sea otters and, and, and uh, sea lions, for example, uh, will be um, will be more likely to be affected if they encounter. I mean, more likely to encounter an oasis. Um, for the seabirds, the, the main reason for the, the mortality is usually the hypothermia, so the loss of the insulation from the from the feather feathers. Uh, which leads to the, to the death uh, of, of the animals or drowning. Uh, they might starve as well if, if they oil oil to the point that they can't feed anymore. With uh, mammals, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, the fur uh, is also uh, part of the uh, thermal regulation uh, uh, system of the of, of the animal. And once it's it's oiled. Um, you know they, they lose they lose insulation plus you know they try to clean up themselves to clean themselves and uh, end up ingesting um, large quantities of, of, of oil now moving on to less 
you know, set type of organisms we, which don't necessarily make the headlines, but might might be uh, affected too. The the the, the benthos, the seabed, the seabed uh, uh, organisms. So uh, when there's a spill of a large spill of of um, light oil, for example, there's been observation of, of very significant mortalities of, of that type of uh, organisms, which can be either mobile or sessile, not moving on, on the sea bottom. Um, there's also the, the, the occurrence of oil sinking, uh, especially heavy oils, heavy fuel oils in particular, uh, which tends to sink in many of the incidents we go to. So there might be some smothering of the seabed. Uh, although again, once once the the, uh, the oil has been removed or has been digested by the environment, if it's not too, uh, if the volume is not too large. Uh, then re-recruitment and colonization is occurring from uh, organism, organisms living uh, in uh, nearby areas which have not been affected. Coral reef and seagrass beds, although rarely directly affected by, by, the, by the oil, they might be if, if there's natural dispersion or, or, or chemical dispersion or, um, or sinking as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of... Um, very key uh, on, uh, ecosystems. The sandy shores impacts. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, at least the top of the of the shore is relatively poor in, in terms of biodiversity and organisms. However, the, the lower part, the you know close to the subtidal, uh, intertidal, lower intertidal area, can be very very rich, uh, in particular in the fine sands. So uh, there's been observation of uh, massive mortalities of invertebrates living within the sand, uh, such as uh, urchins, spatungus, on, on, the, on the picture on the right. Um, so it can happen, it, it's ob observed. Again, recovery fairly quick due to the resilience of the marine systems and all these species being uh, uh, high fecundity um, and, and larval stage uh, organisms as planktonic larval stage. Uh, another sensitive area when it comes to uh, sandy shores uh, it is the upper beach, even though I just said it, it's fairly, it has a fairly low biodiversity. Uh, there's a lot, if, it, if there's a dune behind on top of the, of the, of the beach, there might be an embryonic uh, dune as well at the top of the beach, which is vegetation, which is not always visible because it's annual. Species. And so the, the mechanical cleanup of these type of areas can lead to some uh, damage. And finally, for sandy shores, if there's any uh, sea turtles uh, nesting areas, obviously uh, they might be affected. Affected the adults, uh, the females coming spawning uh, might be affected, and or the uh, the, the, the juveniles uh, hatching from from the eggs when they try to reach the, the sea. When it comes to rocky shores, fairly similar. I mean, the more exposed, again, the more likely to uh, self-clean relatively rapidly. However, there's there's uh, been observations quite uh, that's quite common observation actually of mortalities, especially of the um, grazing species, so limpets and all the gastropods. Uh, Fairy wrinkles and all that, uh, so they they get not they they get uh, so let lethal or some lethal effects, and then then obviously because the gra grazers uh, disappear, you there's a, um, a bloom of, of uh, seaweeds, and generally the first one to bloom are, are the green ones. Again, uh, recruitment fairly rap rapid, months or, or years, depending on the severity of the case of the of the spill, but. Um, from from uh, unaffected area nearby. Other impact, um, although I've, I've mentioned it uh, before, but again, uh, cleanup with very heavy me mechanical means in in rocky areas uh, doesn't help when it comes to the uh, impacts. Uh, salt marshes, uh, salt marshes very quickly. So we we move to the sheltered uh, environments. So salt marshes, basically in temperate region. Uh, very sheltered areas with vegetation, uh, soft sediment and vegetation, highly uh, biologically uh, productive. 
Thank you, Damage. Well, the, the main issue here is uh, persistence of the oil. The oil settles there and, and, and persists, can persist for years. Uh, the oil will eventually, if there's a lot of it, uh, per percolate uh, through the through the, the mud uh, using the, the, the roots and the, and the burrows uh, dug by uh, um, uh, organisms, marine invertebrates. The other high risk for this type of environment is the, is the cleanup and, and aggressive techniques or access which can lead to uh, some uh, significant damage to it. Again, uh, well, similar type of environment but in the in tropical regions, the mangrove, so similar uh, to the previous one, although it's not uh, short plants now, we're talking trees and forests, so very productive, very biodiverse, um, soft sediment usually, I've seen some in rocky areas, but usually soft sediment uh, um, environment, habitats. So when it comes to oil, there's uh, two aspects. The, the toxic effect, if it's a uh, light oil or, or crude oil with uh, a lot of fresh crude oil with a lot of uh, lighter ends. Uh, and then there's, there's uh, smothering of the roots, smothering of the lenticels, which are the little uh, yellow uh, org organs on, on the branches and, and, and roots, on the roots actually, which are used by the plant to extrude uh, salt, which allow the plant to survive. So if they can't, uh, it doesn't function anymore, then the tree might die. So yeah, a few examples. Um, from my own experience uh, traveling on spills uh, worldwide, uh, sometimes uh, significant mortalities of trees, and in particular in cases when there's reoiling, recurrent reoiling of the same trees, so that uh, you know the, the natural flushing doesn't work, and 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 so uh, we observe mortalities at some point. My experience is that in, in spills I've attended with uh, impact on mangroves. Most of the mangrove, a large majority, not more than 90% of the affected mangrove survived well. But uh, from time to time, there's a few uh, persons, actors of areas which are uh, very much affected. And in this case, it was due to uh, an embankment uh, which prevented the fl natural flushing of, 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 the, of the forest, which led to uh, reoiling uh, every time, basically because pockets of oil were being trapped uh, within the, within the, against the, the, the embankment. So, uh, however, a very, very, very strong capacity to cover, even surprisingly. I mean, I've seen trees completely covered, uh, regrowing, and then very quickly we see the thematophores, for example, the, the higher roots on the bottom, uh, bottom right picture, which start regrowing. Uh, obviously, there's a significant mortality, mortality of, of the trees. The, the impact is long-lasting, at least to get back to the normal or to the, the exact same uh, distribution of, of, of uh, demographic distribution of trees. Uh, but very, very often, uh, you know, new uh, seedlings and, and uh, seedlings, uh, we, we start to uh, small trees will start to uh, regrow fairly rapidly. Again, as for the previous uh, example, intrusive, aggressive cleanup can very much increase uh, the severity of damage. And now I'll, I'll be moving to the, the last few uh, examples, but moving to uh, economic uh, impacts. And obviously the main activities usually on, on shores of uh, fisheries and aquaculture. So impacts, there's different types of impacts. First of all, the direct contamination or mortality of the stock. Um, it's rather low risk when it comes to subtitle wild stock because they, they, can, they can move around. Uh, high, high risk, well, except for uh, some species, the flatfish, for example, which are not moving very much. They might be much more affected. But species, obviously, species uh, which are caged um, are, can't, can't really move around. So if there's a significant uh, oiling of the area, then they might be very much uh, affected. Then the breeding and nursery grounds are obviously very sensitive, as we've seen with, with mangroves. Um, and the use of disp dispersion, chemical dispersion or natural dispersion, near shore, near uh, aquaculture facilities by, can be, uh, can be uh, an issue too. And then there's the more 
indirect uh, effect, uh, business interruption. So the fact that the, the fishermen can't fish because uh, there's oil uh, drifting at sea or there's oil spill response going on <clears throat> or the vessel is oiled, et cetera, et cetera. And aquaculture, the fact that sometimes on land-based facilities, for example, they have to stop uh, water intakes. So that can be a, a very significant impact, even though it's not direct uh, damage from the oil, it's, it's, it's due to the fact uh, that there's no a renewal of the, of the water. And then market confidence. Um, traders, uh, consumers might be reluctant to purchase, uh, feeling that there's a, a risk associated with with, uh, with uh, eating the fish, consuming the fish. So very often, and it's 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 the case in in, in some cases or in uh, when there's a significant spill. Uh, so sampling and analysis is very often needed uh, and required to to uh, reassure people and reassure. Well, even the sellers, uh, everyone that uh, the fish or shellfish are within the, the guidelines in terms of uh, seafood safety. Another uh, key pillar of uh, coastal economy is the tourism. So obviously, uh, oiling of, of a shore, sandy beach, you might have to close the beach or probably, probably end up closing the beach. And uh, there's a you know, significant uh, loss of incomes for all the businesses associated with with uh, with uh, recreation. So hospitality businesses, diving, selling schools, uh, shops relying on on the tur tourist influx, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, as for the fish uh, fisheries, public confidence can be affected too. And and again, there's sometimes need to uh, to take samples and and uh, to uh, publicity to uh, restore. The economic uh, attract attractiveness of, of the area, and finally, uh, impacts on ports uh, on industry. So ports, um, what impacts on, on on merchant vessels? If the hulls are, are oiled, they might have to very often need to clean before they leave, and it might be it might have impacts on on birthing capacity uh, to, in the port. So more more time spent uh, anchorage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then uh, any type of facility needing some uh, water cooling, so uh, power stations or desalination plants will obviously suffer if they need to interrupt or, or slow down the, the, the in intake of, of uh, seawater due to the threat of, uh, of a noise, noise leak. So just to conclude uh, a summary, to recap, uh, well, as we've seen, uh, the effect will very much depend on the composition of the oil, the type of oil, and the weathering processes. So the more weathered, the less um, uh, lighter ends um, in, in, in the emulsion. Um, then, as we've seen, there's, there's a wide range of environmental and economic impacts possible. There's probably a few more we could add in. We could have, could have added. Uh, but again, and that's the optimistic part of it, uh, marine life can recover remarkably rapidly through natural processes once uh, the cleanup has done the job to remove uh, the, the bulk of, of, of the oil. Socioeconomic effects of oil spills can be severe in the short term and sometimes in the uh, mid term. And the cleanup, the cleanup response is, uh, is key uh, and uh, Effective cleaner response can mitigate very much mitigate damage, and I guess we will be talking about uh, cleaner response operations and strategies uh, in the next few uh, webinars. So this uh, conclude my talk. Thank you very much, everyone. Again, the same thing as for Jamie. If you have any questions, uh, please use the chat uh, system tab. And uh, Julien, I give you the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, uh, for all this uh, detail, uh, for this detailed presentation. Uh, lots of uh, things to digest again, uh, but that's why we organize uh, several webinars to follow, um, as this will be detailed in other webinars. I'm very conscious of time, so uh, I'll hand over to Colleen for the last presentation before we move to the Q&A session, knowing that there are a lot of questions on the chat. So bear with us, and uh, Colin, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you, Julianne. Um, good, af good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Colleen O'Hagan. I work at the Marine Environment Division at IMO. Um, I'm the technical officer responsible for all matters relating to um, preparedness and response and cooperation on oil and chemicals spills at IMO. Um, first, I just want to quickly thank Emily and Julian for all their ha hard work in putting this webinar series together and for inviting me to contribute. It's great. Um, I see a lot of familiar names in the chat, so it's really lovely to be able to connect with you virtually when we can't travel. Um, I must admit this is my first webinar presenting um, and I'm presenting from quite a noisy household so um, please bear with me I hope the noise doesn't quite filter through to you there at the end. Um, so let's get started well following the presentations by Frank and Jamie I think we're all now experts in both the risks and the potential impacts of oil spills and I think we're all clear now if we weren't already before just how important it is to minimize the risk um, of an oil spill and indeed uh, mitigate the impact if one actually does occur. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about what we are doing about this as an international community, focusing on what IMO has done and is doing in particular. Um, so as a point of order, really, I think it would be useful to put into context why IMO is relevant in this issue of oil spill preparedness and response. And really in a nutshell, as it says on the slide there, IMO is the specialized agency of the UN, which operates as a global standard setting authority for the safety, security, and environmental performance of international shipping. Um, its main role is really to create a regulatory framework for the shipping industry um, that's both fair and effective and universally adopted and universally implemented um, it has 174 member states and three associate member states who work together through numerous committee meetings and subcommittee meetings in this brown coloured building here um, on the slide in central London. Um, and they work together to achieve the organisation's um, mandate, which is safe, secure and efficient shipping on clean oceans. So IMO really is the forum or the mechanism, so to speak, for governments to coordinate and come together and decide on the regulations applicable to shipping. But also within this forum, we sit about 140 or so non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations which support the work of IMO um, and their specific areas of expertise, which can relate to all manner of subject matter areas of shipping so anything from ship design cargo issues seafarer welfare and training and environmental matters to name a few so what happens is basically all these governments and experts work together as imo and develop and adopt instruments or international legislation known as conventions and protocols and as well develop guidelines and guidance at the intergovernmental level that will work to maintain the safety and security of shipping um, and to prevent marine oil pollution from ships. Um, therefore, I think we can gather from this and understand that it really is the appropriate international forum um, with this unique blend of coastal states and experts and technical experts to address the challenges that arise from marine oil spills. I should highlight, however, that I'm a doesn't impose or enforce the rules that it develops. Um, this is really the responsibility of the member states. Um, as the Secretariat, once a, a convention has been developed and adopted, our role is really to encourage as many states as possible to sign up to these rules and also to support them in their efforts to implement it effectively. In practice, um, the work of IMO is governed by its member states, all of them, and supervised by 40 member states that are elected and comprise the IMO Council. Um, the bulk of the work gets done through the five technical bodies um, or committees, um, which look into various aspects of shipping. Um, 
the work of the two committees responsible for safety and security and environmental matters, so that's the Marine Safety Committee and the Marine Environment Protection Committee, are also supported by a number of subcommittees and their acronyms are all listed there for you at the bottom. I think really what's important to note is these committees over, over many years have developed and adopted over 50 legal instruments, um, some of which are listed here on this slide um, and categorized in, in this particular case as either preventative legislation, so acting rules that act to prevent accidents from happening or prevent pollution from ships, mitigating um, legislation, which really looks into mitigating the impact of accidents when they do occur, and also liability and compensation, which deals in particular with, with damage caused by oil pollution. And, and as, as previously mentioned, I won't go into these in detail because there is a whole webinar planned, um, the next one in the series on international legislation, which will look at this in more detail. But I guess what the main point to take away from this is these instruments or conventions have typically been developed to address a particular issue or a challenge that was experienced in a real life um, issue, for example, a shipping accident or a near miss. And really in the early days of the, of the IMO and of the organization, the focus was predominantly on prevention of accidents and um, compensation of damages um, caused by these accidents. Um, and really it wasn't until the 80s um, and in particular following the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska in 1989 that the need for more focus on preparedness, response and cooperation in oil spills was really brought to the fore. And the following year, um, the International Convention on Oil Pollution Preparedness Response and Cooperation or the OPRC Convention was, was adopted. This is the convention I'm responsible for at IMO, and, and, and it's a great one in my humble opinion. I can say that it's clear and it's practical and effective, and it's been ratified by over 131 countries worldwide. Um, and it really provides a global framework for international cooperation in combating major incidents or threats from marine pollution. Um, parties to this convention are re basically required to establish measures for dealing with pollution incidents, either nationally or in cooperation with, with other countries. And, and, and the, the way to do that basically is set out in the various articles of the convention, um, the, the headlines here listed on, on the slide. So as, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's a very practical and effective of, convention and quite central to the work that, that we are doing and, and that we're doing with the GIWACF project. So going back um, to the structure of IMO, really the work related to oil spill preparedness and response and, and the OPRC convention itself is undertaken by the Marine Environment Protection Committee, which consists of all the member states. Um, and it's assisted in this work by the subcommittee for pollution prevention and response, which meets once a year in either January or February in, in normal non-pandemic times. Um, over the last 30 years or so since the adoption of OPRC, this committee um, has really done a lot of work in this particular area of expertise. It's developed numerous guidance documents um, to support the effective implementation of this convention. And um, these cover many aspects of preparedness and response, such as contingency planning, risk assessment, incident management systems, all sorts of, of, of guidances um, have been developed. Um, in addition, the committee has also approved a set of model training courses really to support countries in establishing their own national training and exercise programs. We're also fortunate that many other organizations have also dedicated time and effort to developing guidelines and materials to support the aims of the convention. So, for example, IPICA, who we work with on this um, JAWACA project, um, have developed a comprehensive set of good practice guides or good practice series. Um, ITOF have a series of technical information papers on different aspects of, of oil spills as well as some really great short educational films. 
Cedra or Sorel and um, NOAA in the US have also developed a number of tools and technical papers and field guides that are very useful and informative and, and, and there are many more as well. So there really is a lot of great supporting materials out there to help countries to implement the OPRC conventions. And I think just going back to what I mentioned earlier, um, IMO does adopt uh, and develop legislation, and these are set out as 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 quite um, sort of uh, pub, pub, uh, books uh, and on, on our document server. Um, um, but really, what these are are, are are a lot of words and text, and in order to turn these sort of conventions, let's say, and and, and the provisions of these conventions into actions, they really need to be transposed into national law or uh, uh, domestic legislation and, and enforced. And recognizing really that the domestication uh, implementation and enforcement may, may be a challenge for some countries. IMO, as, as well as developing the guides and training courses that I mentioned, have also established its um, the integrated technical cooperation program or the ITCP as we call it um, to support governments in overcoming the challenges they face in the implementation of the conventions and um, this program really does um, aim to assist countries in building up their human and institutional capacities to to comply with with the various conventions of of IMO and they do this through the delivery of of workshops and seminars and trainings at both the national and the regional level. Um, and within IMO, within the structure, again, it's the Technical Cooperation Committee that oversees the work of the ITCP. Um, and this focuses on the projects and activities um, that, that will really support the widespread adoption of IMO's instruments. Um, and therefore, it's very relevant to our work in, in marine spill preparedness and, and response. Uh, the way the program works, uh, the ITCP, is that countries request technical cooperation assistance from IMO uh, in whatever area um, of the organization's work that they need assistance with. And, and these requests are taken into consideration um, and the ITCP the plan is planned and budgeted and implemented on, on a biennium basis. So these, this will include and uh, involve um, as many of the requests as, as possible um, to be answered um, over a two-year period. Um, to undertake all of these requests for assistance, IMO also builds partnerships with governments and industry and donor agencies to ensure that there's sufficient funding or in-kind support of expertise um, in, under, in order to um, undertake the work um, and the commitments made under the ITCP. And I'm all obviously also recognize the importance of local knowledge and, and regional expertise in, in meeting the challenges um, that particular countries may face. And so where, where, wherever possible, we try to engage regional um, experts as well within the activities that we implement. Uh, the ITCP itself has um, funds activities um, through its global program, and these are typically activities with an international scope. And then it also has regional programs that focuses on activities in specific regions of the world. So Africa, Asia Pacific, Americas, West Asia, and Eastern Europe. Um, to give an indication of, of the number of activities that we implement um, under the ITCP last year, there were 61 environment related ITCP activities implemented by the Marine Environment Division and over a third of these um, were relating to marine pollution preparedness and response. So, so we're so we're very busy in this in this field of work um, in, in our capacity building work. In terms of the activities um, that we undertake, these really cover multitude of topic areas. Um, in support of, of, of preparedness for an effective response to, to an oil spill. And that includes implementing effective legislation, 
contingency planning and the development of specific policies, for example, dispersant use or, or waste management, um, uh, training, uh, development of, of bilateral and multilateral agreements, training exercises, et cetera. Um, we do this using course training courses, workshops, seminars, consultancy-based support. And as ever, we are supported by a number of our key partner organizations, such as ITOP and OSRL or UN Environment or Norwegian Coastal Administration, um, and our fantastic network of subject matter experts worldwide who, who really we couldn't work um, do our work without. And this slide just really goes to um, communicate that um, as part of the UN family, we are actively working towards the, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Obviously, the um, 14 goal, the ocean goal, is, is quite central to the work of IMO. But really, under the ITCP, we think that um, the work that we do could be actually linked to all 17 SDGs. Um, another area where we collaborate under the UN um, family is with UN Environment's Regional Seas Program. Um, this was launched over 45 years ago, um, and it's a real significant achievement by UN Environment. It involves about 13 different regional seas programs and five partner programs that sort of sit within the regional seas family, so to speak. Each program is governed by a convention or agreement between regional governments to really work together to halt the degradation of their adjacent sea areas and coasts um, through sustainable management and use of the marine and coastal environment. And most, if not all of these agreements, incorporate some component on preparedness response and cooperation in oil spills and, and really mirror many of the obligations set out under the OPRC convention. Um, I should actually probably say in some cases, the OPRC convention mirrors the requirements set out in the regional seas agreements because in many, in a few circumstances, the regional agreements um, were actually developed first. So given our um, collective goals in this field, IMO works very closely with many of the regional seas organizations, the secretariats, to implement these regional agreements, and these are all listed here. And in additional, addition to these, we work with a number of others, such as the Nairobi Convention and Abidjan Convention Secretariats in Africa. In many cases, we would jointly organize and implement activities together, such as those I described um, earlier, in order to enhance capacity building um, in spill preparedness and response. Another key partner that we work with is the oil and gas industry. Um, I won't go through this slide in detail because this basically copies with Julien's introduction. Um, but basically, um, under the global initiative, which we is our joint initiative with IPICA, um, we focus on three main areas and uh, GI WACAF being, being one of the projects. And really this program um, and its projects enables IMO to really intensify its efforts in these specific regions and to draw upon the expertise and experience of the oil industry. One of the key factors in the effectiveness, I think, of these projects is their longevity and their sustained presence in, in their respective regions. And the we really have become a trusted and respected source of expertise and support of the member governments and focal points of the projects in these countries. And, and we're very proud of these, these projects and their achievements. So on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll end my presentation. I hope this has given a flavor of what IMO and its partners within um, the UN family and industry are doing to promote effective um, preparedness to oil spills. Um, I'll, Thank you for your attention and hand back to Julian, who will um, really explain what happens next. Thank you very much, Colleen, for this uh, explanation about the work of the IMO. Uh, I invite the other uh, presenters to uh, turn the camera on. Mine is just not working because my connection is too low. Sorry for this. So you could only hear my voice. 
Um, so now it's time, I think, for the Q&A session. Before that, just to mention that all uh, the presentations and uh, files are available uh, to download in, on your webinar interface. So do not hesitate to download them. Um, and let's start the questions. So how will it work? I will read out loud a couple of questions because I'm conscious of time, I'm of time and we have uh, more or less 20 minutes left to uh, answer the questions. There are a lot of, of them, so we'll just pick some and uh, uh, redirect them to the relevant presenter. Uh, some I will uh, answer myself. Uh, for example, I received a question on how can a country can be a member of GIWACAF. Uh, as I said in my presentation, GIWACAF has a very defined a geographical remit of 22 countries. Uh, and uh, so all the countries from Mauritania to uh, South Africa are uh, de facto members of, of GIWACAF. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's not, there is no plan for uh, spreading of the number of countries within GIWACAF. So uh, it's, it's not really uh, possible as it's a geographically focused initiative. Um, another question uh, I think I could uh, have, I've mentioned is the there, is, there are a lot of questions of the use of uh, dispersant uh, in uh, in the in marine in marine water as well in fresh water. So uh, um, perhaps uh, perhaps Jamie, uh, you could uh, answer. There is a question on. Uh, are uh, dispersants being used in fresh water, for example? Is this something that is uh, advisable, or uh, uh, what do you what do you think about this dispersant in fresh water? Thank you. Could you hear me? You you are mute, uh, Jamie. I think. Ah, oh, it seems like we we can't hear Jamie. So maybe a, another another question. Uh, um, that, I mean, on this one, uh, tick, 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 let me. I, I don't know if G, Jamie is as a mute or if it doesn't work. But we can ask another question. Um, uh, let me tick, 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 tick. Uh, a question maybe to, to Frank. There is a question and uh, could you suggest some computer softwares that can be used for modeling response strategies? Uh, do you have any softwares in mind, maybe for the, for the participant, uh, Frank? Uh, for modeling, software for modeling uh, strategies, there's, there's, there's a few, I can't. I know a, a number of software for weathering or for the drift. Uh, you know, drifting, for, forecasting the drift of, of an oil spill, things like that. To model exactly, um, well, there's exactly what will happen. It, it's it's more. Uh, there's a few claim they can do that. I'm not completely convinced, to be honest. <laughs> um, uh, there's the NOAA ones on uh, edges, for example, on the behavior, on the um, uh, weathering, which is very efficient. Uh, there's a number of H on HNS Aloha Noah as well. There's, there's, uh, as I said, a few dealing with what well, came up or oil map dealing with drifting of oil. Some of them came up, I think, does some uh, synthesis on uh, um, you know the budget of the oil, how much oil will end up uh, in the atmosphere, evaporated, uh, sinking on the shore. Uh, I'm, I'm usually more skeptical on that type of things, um, but, but they exist, yeah. That's that's the only one I can think of. Right? Maybe Jamie has more knowledge on this. Okay, f thank okay. you. I think that, yeah, I think we could uh, we could hear you, Jamie. So there was a. Did you hear my initial question about the use of dispersant in in fresh water? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so to go back to that, I don't know, has Frank addressed that at all, or should I just... No, 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 it was... Question? No, you, should, you could answer that, Frank, uh, answer another question. Sure. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, yeah, dispersant in fresh water. Um, one of the main things with dispersant that we need to uh, be mindful of 
is that when used offshore, the uh, concentration of oil as it's distributed uh, vertically within the water column and horizontally through ocean spread, um, ocean mixing, um, it should very quickly allow the level of hydrocarbon uh, or the concentration in those top sort of 10 metres or so of the water to come down to very low levels and non-harmful levels. Um, this is one of the reasons that you we advocate using dispersants in water depth of 20 metres or greater, because you've got then therefore that volume of water, which allows the oil to spread out over and to reach those low levels. Uh, when we look at fresh water use, generally we don't have that large scale, um, that large volume of water to work with. And it's also about the, um, the water exchange. So for example, a, a brackish lagoon, which has minimal um, tidal exchange with a larger body of sea, um, you would expect to see a greater level of oil persisting in that environment for longer, potentially causing harmful effects. Um, so for that reason, generally speaking, uh, dispersant use in freshwater environments is not recommended. So it's not about the effectiveness or the operation of the dispersant itself. It's more about having the, uh, giving the oil the ability or the option to spread out and dilute down to non-harmful levels. I think, thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. I think it's a, it's a very articulate answer. Uh, so this person in fresh water are not recommended. Another question uh, directed to Colleen. Um, can, does the IMO support other countries to have exercise or other oil spill capacity development program if those countries are not member of the IMO? Thank you, Julian. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Um, short answer is yes. Um, we have done and, and, and we can do. Um, it, the support can come in different ways. Um, it may not be directly through um, the ICCP, um, which has got uh, a, limited is a limited resource and a lot of demand on that. And, where we cannot um, fund something in particular or, or a request from a country, um, then we will reach out to partner organizations and, and others who might be able to help us with meeting that request. And, and, we, and we have successfully managed to do that in, in previous incidences. So, so I guess yes is the short answer. Thank you very much, uh, Colleen, for this, for this answer. Uh, and a, a question to Frank, uh, which is, uh, what is the best option on biodiversity, uh, the best response option, sorry, on biodiverse tropical soft sediment habitat, especially mangrove clustered areas? So uh, it's directly linked to your presentation, the best res response options, particularly in mangrove, which are uh, rich, diverse, but fragile uh, ecosystems. So uh, our experience is that the less you do, the less intrusive you do, the better. Doesn't mean you do nothing. You you can collect as much as possible passively outside of the of the mangrove. I mean, it all depends on the configuration of the type of mangrove. Mangrove, if it's fringing, if it's a if it's a forest, if it's very wide, uh, if there's access from behind from from the land. Um, so this, the more access you have, uh, the better you can get to some areas and, and maybe pick up some some pockets of oil. If it's very, very difficult to get in, uh, we would we recommend not to go in and to uh, promote uh, flushing, natural flushing, improve the circulation of water if you can, uh, so that you know the natural movement of water will rinse uh, uh, with time, and which is what happened naturally uh, most 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 cases. Uh, if you can promote that a bit, yeah, that that, that helps. But obviously, if you if you've got very it depends on the type of oil, very thick oil in some areas, and you can access and remove it, it's it's you know it's it's a good option too. So it really depends on on, on the, the situation. But avoid one thing: avoid cutting the trees, even if they're dead, because this they keep the system together. Soil, um, uh, yeah, the, all that type of um, very aggressive approach, trying to uh, high pressure wash the trees or or using rags and, and going all over the place in, inside the inside the mangrove um, to be uh, not to be recommended. 
So yeah, promote natural processes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, another question uh, directed to Jamie. Uh, it's a it's really open question. Uh, it's uh, I read it. Can you propose means of responding according to oil properties? I think it's the vast subject. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so mindful of the, the time limitations we've got, um, I, I could certainly speak for 30 minutes or more on this one. Um, I think the main thing is for an operator, if you have a limited uh, range of oils that you're working with, so you, or you know the types of oil that you may need to respond to, you can then start to get a good idea as to which might be the most appropriate types of response equipment. So um, if we look at containment and recovery, there are a range of skimmers, and unfortunately there is no one perfect type of skimmer for all incidents. Um, so the the nature of the oil uh, the viscosity for example will dictate which skimmers or which types of skimmers will be most effective so um, without going into too much detail very light oils so group two some group three oils um, will work with oleophilic skimmers um, so these take a vast uh, much greater efficiency of oil as opposed to water if you've got a much heavier oil you may only be able to use a mechanical skimmer um, which will potentially take a lot more uh, water with the oil as well. So there's then issues around waste management and so on. Um, so mindful of time, I hope that gives a rough answer, um, but that's certainly maybe one to address um, as a subsequent conversation. So uh, please do send me an email on that one. Yeah, Th thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, so we have uh, three uh, interesting questions to address. And uh, again, there will uh, we will organize other uh, webinars dedicated to uh, means of response at sea and on the shoreline. So this question will be uh, dealt with in a, in a little bit more details later in the in the year. So you'll have uh, more opportunities to ask uh, Jamie question about this one. Uh, another question to Colleen. It's it's in regard with uh, I think it's in regard with GI Wakaf and the geographical remit, which is uh, Western Africa. Uh, and there is a question of, is there a similar initiative for Eastern uh, Africa, so the Indian Ocean? Thanks, Julian. Um, there isn't a, a global initiative project in Eastern Africa. Um, there was some work done on this a, a number of years ago, um, but um, it didn't take off for, for, for a number of reasons. And that, that's not to say that it, it wouldn't happen in the future. It's just um, at present, it, it hasn't been possible to, to launch this. But there are other initiatives and projects and and, and organizations working um, to support the countries in East Africa, one, one in particular um, being the Oil for Development Program, um, that um, Norway's Oil for Development Program, which um, assists a number of countries in, in, in um, East Africa in their capacity building in this in this uh, topic area, and and we have been working with them um, uh, in those countries and and in the region more generally um, recently. But in terms of a, a sustained project like the GI WACAF, um, no, not at the moment. But we're hopeful sometime in the future there might be. Thank you very much, uh, Colin, for this uh, for this answer. Uh, I think it's it's pretty clear the IMO is involved in East Africa, but there is no uh, similar project as the Jawa Calf uh, yet, which is uh, uh, the short uh, answer. Thank you for for this one. Uh, another question that I think will could be directed directed to Frank. Uh, it's going from South Africa, and the question is like this: um, How is the capability of systems to recover from an oil spill? influenced by growing pressures like climate change and other pollution, uh, meaning if there are other pressure at the same time on the ecosystem, uh, does it change anything? Is there, what's the capability to, to recover under that kind of uh, circumstances? Yep, uh, thank you, Julien. Uh, <clears throat> well, the, the more pressure uh, constraints on the system, uh, the more difficult it will be for the system to recover from another, if there's another layer of uh, constraint, 
um, and um, uh, impacts. So, yeah, um, um, chronic pollution, for example, will uh, uh, affect a system for quite a while, and then you can have an oil spill, which which will be the tipping factor, so that uh, the whole system will collapse due to uh, not only the spill, but the, the fact that it's been under pressure for so long. And climate change is the same thing. It's it will very much depend on on uh, the, the species and and habitats, uh, depending on the the tolerance range they have with the climatic uh, parameters. Uh, but you know, if they get close to their limit with one parameter, a, a noise spill can be the, the tipping factor. So yeah, the more the more the more pressure from all from all different type of pollution, climate climate climatic change. Etc. Etc. The more uh, the, the more uh, the more the system is under constraints and and uh, may have much more difficulties to, to recover. Uh, thank you for uh, just uh, to um, uh, another question, which is directly linked to this one. Do you have uh, do, did you observe recent trends? Uh, do, I mean, if uh, on on the recovery of ecosystems, Frank, uh, when you attend uh, when you attended. Uh, Oil spills. Uh, did you? I mean, have you noticed, for example, the the climate change effects on some ecosystems? I mean, seeing that these years it's it takes a longer time to recover than it used to be a uh, uh, couple of years ago, maybe. Uh, no, no, because uh, well, I mean, the statistical, uh, would, you know, the number of cases uh, would not be enough for for my own experience. I mean, I can tell from where I live, uh, it's it's much warmer. Than it usually is, but you know, it's uh, you can't conclude anything anywhere. But uh, it, it's um, no, no, I haven't, I haven't seen uh, uh, obvious um, no effects, adding effects from from climate change. I've seen effects from chronic pollution, from other pressures, plastic uh, pollution, uh, all sorts of you know chronic effects. But uh, well, climate change, it's a bit more difficult. Um, I mean, it would it would mean also going in the same areas for several times, which we do so from time to time. But um, maybe what? Well, yeah, it's a possibility. But I haven't personally uh, seen that. Okay, no, good. I mean, it's it's interesting to see that maybe we lack uh, data sets, or uh, ex I mean, we we lack a bit of time to see if there is a direct uh, link between the two. Uh, I have a qu question for for Jimmy. Uh, it's linked to the the um, oil, uh, I mean, the, the oil behavior. Uh, I read the question, what is the estimated time intervals for oil to transition into various phases and which phases is, if any, overlaps? Um, um, yeah. Okay, so regarding phases, I'm not, so I might ask you to interpret as well, Julianne, is that, are we looking at going through the weathering process there? I think it is uh, when you said, uh, yeah, uh, this. I mean, dispersion, all these uh, various phases of the of the oil sure. behavior. Um, okay, absolutely. So there's unfortunately there's not an absolute time um, that we can say that after so many hours, um, emulsification, for example, will take place. Um, for all of those varying fates that I spoke about, there are different factors which will um, accelerate or um, prevent or limit the rate or the extent to which those happen. So those are environmental parameters, such as temperature and wind speed, for example, will drive greater evaporation. Um, there are factors relating to the oil itself, so the viscosity and the asphaltine content that will drive emulsification. Um, and then all of those are going to be influenced by the sea conditions as well. So greater wave energy will um, then give you greater mixing. So, for example, that's going to drive a greater level of natural dispersion, uh, but also potentially accelerate the emulsification process. Um, for specific oils, you can run um, laboratory tests to give you a better run understanding or indicator of how those oils will behave in realistic real world conditions. So if there are specific crude oils that you're concerned about, you can get a good un understanding of how quickly those will emulsify, for example, or to what extent they will lose volume by evaporation or natural dispersion in the, the environmental conditions that you would expect to encounter in your area of operation. 
So while there's not an absolute answer, you can go into further research on the individual crudes and the individual circumstances you're working with to give you a, an indicator uh, for each operation. Thank you very much, Jimmy. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, all people on this and the response, there are no, uh, not much uh, silver bullets and uh, lots of, uh, yeah. not. no, unfortunately not. Uh, okay, uh, we still have uh, three minutes to go. So, um, and we have a lot of questions to answer. To answer so I will uh, pick one or two last questions. Uh, I, there is one uh, from someone who is aware of the uh, IMO 2020 uh, regulation. Uh, it's uh, the question is like this: Have there been any work done on the effectiveness of dispersant on low sulfur fuels? Um, I, I I I can't see you anymore. I hope you can hear me. Uh, any volunteer to answer that question? It could. Uh, I mean, each of you may have something to uh, to say on this one. Um, maybe we could start uh, with uh, with Jamie. Yeah, sure thing. Julian, we can still hear you, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so regarding dispersants on low sulfur fuels, I know it's something that there is a lot of work ongoing. Um, so obviously as low sulfur fuels are going to become uh, more and more prominent in the industry as a whole and globally, um, it's something that we are going to potentially be exposed to, large scale uh, releases of low sulfur diesel, for example. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of dispersants, I know there is work that has been ongoing um, relatively recently, um, suggesting that certainly it should be fundamentally amenable to dispersants. Um, but I think the, the range of properties that low sulfur fuels will um, incorporate make it very difficult to um, give an absolute answer on that one. Don't know if anybody else would uh, expand further on that at all. No, well, same thing really. Uh, I know there's a lot of research going on on uh, low sulfur fuels, specifically on uh, on these persons. I'm not aware of of that, though. I guess uh, Sintef in Norway is doing a lot on the, on low sulfur fuels, so I'm sure, if not yet, they will uh, probably do uh, testing on uh, these persons and other techniques, high uh, fluorescence techniques. But there's probably yeah. other initiatives, uh, in, you know, probably in the US, Canada, different parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, there are definitely lots of things going on. I think it's a, yeah, it's a brand new topic, and a lot of people are getting interested by it. A uh, very last question addressed to uh, Colleen, uh, someone from Mexico, and is uh, writing. This is a webinar for Africa, not only for Africa. I'm glad that we see people from uh, other continents. Uh, he is writing. Uh, uh, that uh, I want to know if there if there are sh should schedule any project workshop or activity for Mexico or how IMO is uh, active in Mexico and is there anything uh, in Mexico at the moment and that will be the last question. Um, thank you, Julian. Um, basically, within the wider Caribbean, we work with. I mentioned in my presentation about the UN regional seas program and there's um, a center in the wider Caribbean, Rock Ram Protect Carib, um, who we work very closely with to implement capacity building activities um, throughout the wider Caribbean. I think they did uh, undertake a national workshop on contingency planning last year in Mexico. Um, I'm not sure on the plans for future given the, the current situation. We have no um, all our plans uh, for future activities are currently on hold. Um, but, you know, um, like um, I mentioned in my presentation, if if there are requests for assistance to IMO or to RAC Rempotec Carib, for example, we can we can do our best to program in an activity in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. Uh, I think uh, uh, we are... Uh, I mean, it's 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 the end of the of the time we have allocated for this webinar. And uh, sorry for the question that haven't been answered yet. Uh, as you, as as mentioned, you can write to us directly if there are burning questions. Um, and uh, I would like to thank all the participants for attending this workshop. We have we had more than two hundred participants attending, so it's uh, it's really a lot. Thank you very much for your attendance, um, and uh, thank you.
as well uh, to the presenters and experts who uh, gave their time for uh, explaining and uh, talking us through these uh, interesting topics. As mentioned, there will be other webinars organized by the GIWCF uh, later on, uh, webinars on various topics uh, that will um, allow you for more uh, deeper understanding of this, uh, of this uh, very interesting topic. And uh, once again, thank you very much and uh, have, a, have a very good day.